Uh, so to take you into what we're going to get up to today, this is the speakers. I thought I had the slide, but I couldn't tell. Uh, our agenda. So we're in a bit of a welcome and framing. This is where we are now. Uh, we're going to ask you to check in. Uh, for those of you that have joined us before, this will be familiar. For those of you that haven't, it will be very straightforward. Just a way of bringing you into the, to, into the conversation as active participants. Uh, we're going to hear a little bit from the speakers, uh, one by one, just their intros. Uh, and then the main way that we're going to hear from the speakers today is in pairs. So first, we're going to hear from Valerie and Aubrey, then a little space for some Q&A with yourselves. Uh, then we're going to hear from Roberto and Daryl, more space for some Q&A. Uh, and then we're going to break out into these discussion groups. Uh, but stay tuned and stay connected because we're going to come back in for a final bit of a panel discussion. Um, before some final words and some checkout. So that is how the conference or how today's session is going to work a little bit familiar and a little bit different. Um, yeah, and so obviously to kind of say uh, this is a new way of working for many of us, uh, partly because it's virtually uh, and it just means we need to be a little bit different. We can't just do a conference session and partly because we really want to recognize the getting uh, getting a group of people like yourselves together, it would really be a disservice if we didn't try and crack open the expertise that you all have, as well as creating an opportunity to hear from the speakers. So really, we've designed the session as a way of both uh, hearing from speakers, but also hearing from yourselves and really allowing for the wisdom, expertise and ex experience that you all bring. Uh, recognizing that the conference uh, is always, always a way for you folks to connect. And so we really want to create space for that again. So like to try and keep that in mind as we're in our conversations. Uh, we know that you may have seen the virtual participation before. There was a video certainly that went out earlier, but if not, just to kind of give you a little guidance and how best to be in this conversation to kind of make the most of the tech and the way that we're going to connect. Um, if you can, uh, you can enter your name, uh, change if you've got somebody else's name, it's somebody else's Zoom account, or you've joined by a bunch of digits. It can really help if we see your name. And that's kind of just a way of trying to create connection really amongst us all. It just kind of personalizes the experience. Uh, as we step into conversations and asking questions and input, uh, like an encouragement around, you know, speaking from experience, not just opinion, listening to learn uh, and really being aware of ensuring we hear from everybody and giving good space. If you can, camera on, but we also totally understand that it's just not possible for you all. Um, and regardless, uh, please mute when you're speaking. It just kind of keeps out the background noise. We are all still finding our uh, way through virtual spaces. And so for us all, as we navigate PowerPoints and phone connections and all that stuff, a little bit of patience and presence and empathy as we navigate, each one of us navigate technology. Uh, as we look to contribute and speak into these uh, sessions, um, a real encouragement to do so from a place of like amplifying value and also from a place of shared inquiry, no right or wrong, uh, just a place of learning together. And finally, uh, we've got a lot to do with you all. We want to make the most of the session. And sometimes that means we might just kind of like move along and have a bit of guidance and facilitation. So um, just allow for that a little. Final things that I would say on that are also just remember to kind of use your chat box wisely. Uh, it's going to be public messaging. And so just think about what you're typing in there, and you know, that is going to be seen by a lot of people. So to kind of be aware of that. Some really basic orientation into the Zoom. At your top right, you can rename yourself. There's some uh, buttons there which enable you to switch from gallery view, which is all of the faces, to the speaker view, uh, which is particularly helpful when we come to our panelists. It lets you focus on the speaker. Uh, if you scroll down to your bottom, you can see your mute button, video, uh, and your chat function, which is going to be the way that we'll ask you to contribute in the kind of chat. Um, check in and, and later on in the session. So just quick orientation there. If you need support, if you're on the phone, we've got a phone number 505-393-1355. That's gonna go into the chat box. So don't worry, although you probably can't see that. I'm just thinking. So it's 505-393-1355. Uh, if you are uh, using your computer, you can see a screen, you can PM. Uh, any of the hosts and they'll be able to help you and keep an eye out for anyone who might have volunteer 
or co-host in front of their name, there are folks that you can private message uh, independently who will be able to um, kind of give back if you have any problems at all in terms of technology. All right. We're in, I think that's all we need to say in terms of setting up and framing. And now we're on to Sarah, who's gonna bring us into a little uh, check-in. Right. Um, so uh, we like to kind of ground into our sessions by uh, asking all of you a question um, that you get to respond to. I'm gonna to try to uh, make myself visible here. Um, so today's question, today's topic is really about collaboration for uh, uh, collaborative land restoration for resilience, right? And so we thought a good place to start would be to ask you all to ponder for a moment, what is your relationship to the land? Uh, for those of you who have joined us at previous conferences, um, we often ask questions like, what is your land ethic? So uh, today's conversations are really about trying to connect the dots between what are our relationships to other people and how does that really impact our, the way that we engage in land stewardship and by virtue of that, our relationship to the land. So the check-in question that we'd love for you to answer into the chat box is, how would you describe your relationship to the land? and not to anthropomorphize your relationship to land, but you could go sort of the very visceral direction. You know, think about you have relationships to significant people in your life, and maybe it's the uh, way that um, your partner's hand feels or the way that your grandmother's house smells that really evokes some of the deep meaning for you of those relationships. Um, so, you could talk about like, what are the things that evoke the way that you feel and interact with the land? Um, or you could go sort of more uh, um, cerebral or, uh, you know, more literal. My relationship to the land is, um, you know, managing for these ecological values. Uh, there is no wrong answer, but just to try to help evoke what we'd like you to put there. So. Um, go ahead and uh, take some time to think about it and then to respond into the chat box. I'm so excited to, I'm gonna start reading some things from the chat box. You all can read them there also, but it's nice to hear them out loud sometimes. I'm so excited to finally own my own land and to be able to start working with the soil and producing, the, producing food. The land uh, as an entity is my happy place and where I go to find comfort and peace. Mutual sustenance, food grown on land, nurtures and sustains me. I work to nurture and steward and sustain the land. Endlessly fascinated by the movement and ecologic in ecology, biogeochemical cycles, migrations, seasons. When I'm walking outside and connecting with nature, I feel guided by wise ones held by deep knowing beyond anything I know consciously and I feel deeply embedded uh, as a being of Mother Earth. Land is my source of healing. Land is my relative. And I'm, I'm an admirer. First and foremost, a steward and eater. I need water and food to survive as a human being. The food that I grow and the air that I breathe, the water that I drink come from this land. I also want to fully respect heritage. Sad and painful. It's like a lost loved one. As an indigenous person, we don't have access to the ancestral lands that we know we now have to sneak and trespass to access. I'm a product of the land. 
I enable landowners to be better stewards of uh, the land, focusing on the relationship with biology and how they can facilitate a better um, environment. Uh, focused on soil and the microbes, microbes that live there and part of the land. All right, really beautiful thoughts there. Thank you all for posting there and sharing. Um, really appreciate all of those. All right. Rona, I think I'm going to hand it over to you now. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you all. Uh, that felt really beautiful and uh, definitely was getting a sense of the spaces you were standing and uh, what being on the land means for you all. So thank you for sharing that little bit of yourself into our chat. Uh, and now we kind of turn our attention towards the speakers. Um, we are first going to do uh, just a little intro from each of them, a short kind of two, three minutes. Um, and so I don't know if there are slides organized for this this way, sorry, just to check, or whether we just want to speak to each one individually. Why don't we just say we start with Aubrey, and then we're going to hear from Rodrigo, and then we're going to hear from Valerie, and then we're going to hear from Daryl. Um, so Aubrey, we'll hand over to you when you've got slides. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with me today. I'm Aubrey Strike Krug. Um, I'm here at the Lind Institute, which is an agricultural research and education nonprofit. And I'm the director of Ecosphere Studies. And I wanted you to see in this opening image uh, what Ecosphere means. It's another way of talking about this uh, critical zone and creative nexus that is the land, the integration of air and water um, and light and life, all the creatures. Um, so what we're seeing here is that critical zone of uh, land and soil. And I wanted you to also be able to see the power of perennials um, for the land. So we can see the difference um, in root systems uh, between annual and perennials here. And we can see the diverse ecosystem that perennials can foster. And at the Land Institute, we are working to create diverse perennial grain agricultures um, to sustain ecosystem processes and to nourish people. So here is an an uh, image from the Land Institute's main campus just south of Salina, Kansas, uh, in Ka and Pawnee homelands. And I wanted you to be able to see the beautiful mixed grass prairie remnant here at the top of the hill. And then as you look down towards the hill, towards the Smoky Hill River, um, you can see uh, some of our research plots um, where we're working on creating these perennial grains and uh, creating perennial cropping systems um, and doing the work that I'm involved in, which is about creating learning communities um, in, to build relationships with these perennials. So a little bit about the land and the plants. And I also wanted in my introductions uh, to show you some of the people. Um, people are part of agriculture and the point of agriculture. And I'm really lucky to work with an incredible research community um, of plant breeders, ecologists, educators, all kinds of staff and technicians. And so I wanted you to meet them during my introduction today as well. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank you so much, Aubrey. And within your two minutes as well. Fantastic. Uh, okay, over to Rodrigo. Thank you. Yo, give me one second. Okay, so I think I cannot share my screen actually, but, oh, there we go. Can you see my screen now, I guess? Okay, so my name is Rodrigo Sierra Corona. I'm a conservationist from Mexico. I got born in Central Mexico in a town called Querétaro, which used to be Otomi and Pameland. 
And during my career, I pretty much moved, I moved to North Mexico, kind of to the borderlands between New Mexico, Arizona, Sonora, and Chihuahua, which is to be the lands of the Janos, the Sumas, and the Apaches. And I started as a wildlife ecologist. Mexico doesn't have public lands. We have less than 2% of our terrestrial mass as public lands. So pretty much every piece of land has an owner or many owners, and mostly it's under some sort of use. So I started working with some of the non-favorite species for ranchers, right? Like jaguars, prey dogs, bison. And most of the times it was like this hate and love relationship with the ranchers that own those particular piece of land because they were the holders and the reason why those species were there. And sometimes they were the reason why those species won't last. So that pretty much prompted me to change directions and instead of pursuing just wildlife ecology, I went into land management and how to, how to move from the current practices to kind of like a brighter, brighter future. And I think that's how I ended in land management. So pretty much I've been fascinated by restoration and the changes on how we perform productive, productive activities across the, across the globe. And that brought me to California where I'm the stewardship director for Santa Lucia Conservancy, which I will talk a little bit more about that later. And so yeah, so super happy to be part of this of this panel, and I hope I hope the people uh, participating really talk uh, about their own experiences and resilience and change, and and how we go to a better place. Thank you, Diego. Thank you so much. I love the pictures. Thank you for sharing. Uh, okay, I think Valerie, that's yourself. Hi, I think I'm just waiting for my slides to get brought up and, and we can get started. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. Good morning or good afternoon. And welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Valerie Small, and I am the National Program Director for Trees, Water, and People. Um, I'm also an affiliate faculty at agri in the Agricultural Biology Department at Colorado State University. Next slide, please. I would like to make uh, it known that we are in Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, and where we sit, we respectfully acknowledge that we sit within the land today that is traditional and ancestral, homelands of the Arapaho, Ute, and Cheyenne. Next slide, please. So who are we? Trees, Water, and People began 22 years ago working in the international communities in Guatemala, Honduras, uh, El Salvador. Um, we have worked in Africa as well. But primarily, our mission is to support community-led regenerative natural resource projects that will improve the local economies, uh, support social and cultural lifeways of indigenous and marginalized peoples, both within the US and abroad. Um, we at TWP believe that ecosystems within reservations throughout the US are best protected when those people design, lead, and economically benefit from and participate in their care and management. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? We do it through really indigenizing our approach through empowering tribal sovereignty. And our national program vision really works through a tribal engagement process in how we work with tribes and how we identify potential partners to help build capacity for our tribes uh, within Pine Ridge, um, South Dakota. We also work in New Mexico uh, with a recently formed Tri Pueblo Coalition that consists of Santa Domingo, uh, Pueblos, uh, Cochiri, and Jemez. And in the background of my uh, current uh, space, you can see that James Calabasa is uh, up above me, right to my left. 
um, in this picture. And this is a recent picture of he and a member from the Jemez tribe planting trees um, in forest in New Mexico on Jemez land. Next slide, please. So what does it mean exactly on indigenous planning and processes? Really what we're working towards is more of a per indigenous or by indigenous people. Um, a lot of what we saw earlier uh, in the last 10 years has been more pro-Indigenous uh, for people. And we uh, really embrace the fact that there's a people, place, knowledge, values loop in indigenizing our philanthropy and our approach in the national program. So we work with Indigenous peoples by identifying specific uh, partners that will work well and are approved by the tribes. Uh, but the focus is always in building capacity so that they can do their own land management um, utilizing their own traditional and contemporary histories, world views, beliefs, values, and attitudes. Um, and so this is the kind of loop that you're looking at when uh, your planning process is really becoming indigenized. Next slide, please. So our TWP national program really uses an indigeneity um, kind of uh, mindset um, from Dr. Dan Wildcat uh, from Haskell Indian Nations University. Um, and what we are doing is trying to empower tribal sovereignty through culture, ecology, and food systems, as was in our recent five-week seminar. So what we do is respect the sacredness of all things. And our, our beliefs are that the land is actually not separate apart from us. Rather, all things are sacred and bringing in the inclusion of those elders with that language and traditional knowledge of the sacredness and also passing on that knowledge of language and traditional knowledges to youth. So we have an important youth component in all of our uh, res restoration projects uh, within these tribal nations. We also do solar energy youth engagement, ecosystem resilience, landscape scale restoration or reforestation projects on burn scar sites currently in New Mexico. Um, we focus traditionally on these foods and medicines that are gathered from these forest systems that, um, and also within grasslands that essentially have been disturbed to the point where they're no longer really available any longer to harvest a lot of those traditional foods and medicines. So it's a decolonization of the food systems um, and distributions within tribal nations that we try to work along with them. And we do it through building trust, long-term relationships, and um, we try it through building capacity of these indigenous nonprofits uh, and also partnerships like Quivera. Next slide, please. And we do it through looking at value added action. So it's regenerative, not really sustainable uh, that we look at. And so, you know, these words are important in how we approach. And I think any should approach resiliency versus climate change. So building resilient communities, reciprocity versus transaction, uh, decision-making and shifting from internal to external or tribal needs driven, recognizing and reflecting on uh, value systems. So non-capitalist economies is key and self-determination, empowering communities and capacity building and technical assistance is how we uh, define our indigenous approach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you for that. Okay, and the final speaker intro is uh, Daryl. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And uh, first off, I <clears throat> just appreciate the opportunity to be here with you all today. And and be part of this panel and the, and the Quivera people. Uh, it, it, it's truly an honor for me and uh, thank my colleagues here at work and, and those at the Burley County Soil Conservation District. So uh, my name is Daryl Oswald. I've worked for the Burley County Soil District for 21 years and I work with farmers and ranchers uh, with planning cropping systems, grazing systems, tree plantings, everything conservation and, and regenerative. Uh, since 2016, I've managed uh, what we call the Burley County 
Minokin Farm. It is owned by the soil, uh, Burley County Soil and Water Conservation District. It was established in 2009 and it is a combination of natural resource education and systems approach conservation and regenerative agriculture. Uh, and that's mainly what I'm going to focus on with you today is the systems approach conservation and regeneration uh, related to the resiliency or lack thereof that we have in our current production model. It's not simply enough to conserve a degraded resource, but we need to regenerate it. Uh, also, uh, uh, on a personal note, I am a fourth generation rancher uh, located 45 miles northeast of Bismarck, North Dakota here. And uh, we manage our ranch with a holistic approach. And uh, of course, that's how we manage our resources and we have since 2006. And uh, all things are managed with improving soil health and mind and keeping regeneration in the forefront uh, for my, for the, my daughters and uh, our future generations. So what's going on at the Minokin farm? If you were to come there and see, you'd see the cropping system, grazing systems, outdoor gardens, high tunnels, shelter belt, urban conservation, the composting, uh, the bioreactors, the bioinoculant, and of course, at the first and foremost is information and education. Uh, we currently host about, annually about 50 different groups at the Minokin Farm. And, and so uh, we talk a lot about uh, resiliency and sustainable and regenerative agriculture. So. With that, I think I'll just leave it with that and uh, so we can move on with the program. But again, I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and uh, look forward to any and all your questions, so. Thank you so much, Daryl. We appreciate you joining us, absolutely. I'm sure folks are gonna learn a lot today. Okay, so we're gonna shift into our first pair of speaker conversation. Just a flag, a minor shift in, in process. We said we wanted patience and uh, presence. We are gonna have two pairs of speakers. We're gonna hear from Valerie and Aubrey. We're gonna give you a little minute to just kind of digest that um, and then hear from Daryl and Rodrigo and then we'll have a QA. and uh, a Just so you kind of know we're slightly changing from what I um, indicated at the start. Uh, and speakers, if you do hear a little tinkling, although I think I had a duck noise set, which was quite uh, alarming, that will be uh, me indicating that you're kind of pretty much at time. So don't get alarmed. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna share my screen with the question and then I'll, I'll just move straight on to yourselves after that. So hang on a wee minute. Mm -hmm. So Valerie, I think you were up first in this. And the question that we would uh, really love you to dive into, knowing that you'll both come at this from slightly different directions. Um, and I know that certainly you indicated the kind of collaborations that you were in, but for you both, within the work that you do, who do you work with and uh, what collaborations do you support and foster? And how do these contribute to restoration and resilience? Thank you so much. Um, I think my slides will be coming up in shortly. So uh, the way that trees, water and people, the way we work um, in building resilience within communities is really taking a tribal community engagement model and basically through community development and focusing on long-term health and well-being, revolving around their natural resources. Um, because if the land is sick, the people are sick. Um, Long-term development within these communities includes building partnerships that really share the values of the community design led and implemented projects. Um, we are also working within ancestral tribal lands to try to support uh, tribal access um, in, because boundaries are not necessarily at the end of a particular watershed system or ecosystem. So oftentimes you have park service or forest service or private lands that are traditional ancestral lands. So we also try to make sure that 
we are working within a landscape scale process, uh, particularly where you have a lot of fire down in the Southwest um, with burn scar sites, working also in, uh, we'll be working with Ute Mountain Ute Tribe in, in the Colorado on helping them as well in the Mancos River watershed. Um, and working with other people within that watershed system is kind of key, but it's important to make sure that indigenous peoples have these front row seats at the table in our, and have the voice. Um, so we develop our relationships with funders and donors to help support these projects, um, to support those local indigenous and community nonprofits um, that, that are working currently in their, system, their communities to support and build um, a separate and, and private um, entity that will help feed their own people um, and improve their diets, improve their health of their people. So how we do this is by honoring tribal sovereignty and cultural norms and priorities and allowing them lead, to lead the way. Next slide, please. So it's really about human dimensions and building capacity in what we do in tribal forest ecosystems restoration, that ecology and food systems is one and the same. Many of these uh, areas are natural areas that in which they were traditionally harvested foods have been deeply disturbed either through fires or floods or uh, and as climate change continues to exasper exacerbate these um, you know extreme weather events um, we're going to continue to see the need for uh, tribes to be able to uh, develop resiliency in response to those so what we do is take the climate adaptation plans they've written, um, and that might include burn scar sites, renewable energy, and hazard mitigation projects through these climate change driven events and do and help to fund the on the ground projects, which often are lacking due to the uh, inability of them to access funding through BIA. BIA provides a lot of funding for planning, but not a lot for the projects to actually happen on the ground. Um, and that might include also tribal rangelands, for instance, sagebrush, uh, invasive cheatgrass management. Next slide, please. And so the key to successful tribal engagement for us in, in, is respecting these indigenous knowledges that you know have this history of how to manage the land, particularly looking at soils uh, in some of those burn scar sites um, and knowledge and control of the mobilization of that particular land, intergenerational involvement. So connecting youth with elders in these projects is key also to sort of help that transfer of intergenerational knowledge. Um, so we took a look at it from a self-determination across cultural education opportunity and to you know, really get them involved early on in the process. These are all keys to involving indigenous peoples within say a larger watershed project that involves federal and state and local agencies. Next slide, please. So knowledge of ceremony and cultural protocol involving indigenous knowledge practitioners, both youth and elders, involving practitioners in the development and monitoring of protocols, especially those elders who have longer perspectives of, of observations so oral histories and elders' knowledges to make sense of those socio-environmental change or dynamics that are currently happening. So beginning and ending aspects of partnerships, including these workshops and meetings um, with ceremonies that situate the work in a specific place that's key, that involves spiritual forms of knowledge in these partnerships. Indigenous languages, recognizing that these languages are really integral parts of the indigenous knowledge systems. Next slide, please. So our challenges are really how to overcome quality over quantity um, because a lot of funders want just to fund a whole lot of trees to get planted to sort of alleviate the uh, guilt of some of these corporations that are really just wanting to put in a lot of trees because their carbon um, you know, is not being sequestered well enough uh, through their own you know, processes. So we do it through tribal land restoration projects that are guided through a cultural and individual tribal priorities, not necessarily the conservation of federal, state, and local 
people, but rather the tribal priorities. So we try to reference um, also them that they're landholders, not stakeholders. So working within a multi-actor collaborative project, the indigenous voice is often left out of that process. And so we also wanna make sure that we have the right treat, the right place with climate change happening and you have increased drought and you know, increased fire intensity. It's important to be able to look at it from uh, a scientific perspective, but including that indigenous voice within that is how you best work within tribal communities to make sure that they're running, uh, they're leading the way uh, for their particular priorities. And COVID-19 really is a challenge in any community-based project. But I think as we move forward, we try to make sure that we're safe in all of our, pro our projects that we're doing. Uh, next slide. So one paper I'll refer you to is one that was written by a colleague of mine, Kyle powell Swake. Um, factors that support indigenous involvement in multi-actor environmental stewardship. Next slide, please. Um, so that's an important paper and the results that show really uh, success is really looking at uh, the goal of the partnership and uh, partnership outcomes in having indigenous voices at the beginning of the planning process. Um, next slide, please. So our challenges in collaborative environmental problem solving really is looking at tribes as sovereign nations and recognizing there are different worldviews within the management framework. A broad ecological issues aren't limited to geography. So we know we have to work within, you know, a, a, a large landscape scale process with other landowner types, but it's important to recognize the tribe's political authority and their formal and legal binding agreements are really key and to respecting values and knowledge systems and balancing the decision-making between indigenous and non-indigenous. Next slide. So I'd like to thank you all so much. Aho, Kashila. This is James Calabasa, our national program coordinator, who is a citizen of Santo Domingo, uh, Pueblo, Santo Domingo. Aho, thank you so much. I hope I didn't go over my time. Valerie, that was incredible. Thank you for sharing all the learning and deep wisdom that you're bringing in to this conversation. Thank you. Okay, Aubrey, uh, same question. Tell us about the, the people you work with, the collaborations you kind of support and, for, support and foster, uh, and how these contribute to land restoration and resilience. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, uh, just in the next few minutes, talk about two different sort of collaborative streams of work um, that the Ecos for Studies program that I direct at the Land Institute um, leads and is involved in. So the first of these collaborative projects um, is called Civic Science. Um, as I mentioned, the Land Institute is working to develop new perennial cereal grains and legume and oilseed crops. Um, and civic science is a method and a way to bring people into the domestication process um, in order, we hope, to uh, help accelerate it, but also to do uh, some of what Valerie was talking about and in incorporating human dimensions and the opportunity to build accessible and intergenerational and we hope perennial relationships um, of value with these crops in process. So in our civic science communities, we share seedlings of these uh, plants with people around the country um, who grow them in their homes or backyards or community gardens. Um, and they collect data and observations um, that are useful for us scientifically, but they also share their stories and experiences with us and with each other um, in community as they start to get to know and care for these plants. And so we're really interested to understand the types of knowledge that they gain through these relationships, but also to better understand the diverse types of knowledge and lived experiences that they bring to um, these relationships um, in these communities. Um, so in our civic science work, let me see if I can show you just briefly, we have three different pilot communities um, with participants around the US. Um, working with our perennial oil seeds and perennial legumes program. And 
uh, I wanted just to highlight the perennial oil seeds program because this plant is especially exciting. So I collaborate with these people all around the US and we all collaborate with these plants. Um, this plant species is named Silphium integrifolium. Um, a common name is rosinweed. It's a native prairie perennial plant. You can see just how deeply rooted um, this perennial is in that picture. Um, and that's what drew the attention of our plant breeder as well as the attention of past ecologists um, because of the potential drought resilience um, of this plant species. It's related to sunflower and so we're interested in domesticating um, with this plant as a oilseed crop. Um, and to be able to do this, we have to uh, listen to and honor that this is a native plant that native peoples have knowledge of and relationships to. So it's really important to build communities that have uh, just ways of, of learning with um, and including many people um, and allowing them to also lead these processes. So with both of these uh, communities, these civic science communities, we are excited about uh, growing them um, and finding more and better strategies um, to be able to do this. And because this is a native prairie plant, uh, the work that we do and that our community participants are doing also helps us retain and foster the genetic diversity of this species. Um, and as we do that sort of ecotype conservation work, um, we hope to build uh, more capacity to do prairie restoration um, and to support that with other people as well. So just a quick reminder that the civic science work, um, we hope uh, builds positive social capacity and relationships and people and resilience. And we also hope that it helps us uh, advance toward an agricultural system um, that has many positive ecological benefits along with those social benefits um, and educational outcomes for participants. So we hope that perennial grain agriculture can both feed people um, and help us relate in a more generative way to the planet. In our civic science work, I wanted especially to lift up the importance um, of care and to recognize the care work that goes into projects and collaborations like this. Um, a particular author who works in disability justice work, Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samarasena, has been uh, really instructive for me and inspiring for me in understanding um, how care work is not something that our current mainstream dominant society values very much. Um, this is sort of the essential labor of just taking care of places and landscapes and young people and elders and the maintenance of our daily lives. Um, but it's a recognition that this work is absolutely fundamental and necessary and we have to find ways to practice it and value it um, as we move forward into a more just and equitable future. So um, in their book, uh, this author writes about how these communities of care are ones that we all need, we all depend upon, we're here because of them. Um, and all of us need to be able to put in the various types of labor um, that will allow us to create these communities going forward and sustain the human community um, in this era of transition as well. So I wanted to talk about one more sort of stream of collaborative work um, and partnership in the Lynn Institute's Ecosphere Studies program. And this is a, a set of collaborations that we're at the early stages of that are really about building new relationships and partnerships for near-term perennialization. So we know as we uh, look at the bottleneck that we are in at a planetary level of what needs to happen to address climate change, we know that bringing perennials onto landscapes, whether that's restoring native healthy perennial ecosystems and as well as building new perennial agroecosystems through agroforestry and through perennial grain agriculture. We know these are really important and urgent. So we're building new partnerships and projects related to this, which we hope help people maintain themselves as well as increase perennialization of lands. So um, here's a screenshot from an educational video series I did about perennial practice, recognizing that perennialization is ongoing practical work and we also have been uh, involved in a project um, emerging from the University of Wisconsin-Madison called Grassland 2.0. 
um, that is about uh, building uh, perennial uh, landscapes um, and the next version of grasslands um, that engage everyone um, and that serve the common good. Um, and that also address uh, historical and ongoing uh, systems of harm. So uh, this work involves the creation of learning hubs um, and sites for people to come together to create agroecological transition plans. Uh, I work with partners around the world um, in some of our perennialization projects. So this is a photograph from a trip a couple of years ago to the West Bank in Palestine, where a research team is working on developing perennial agroecosystems that include uh, the very long time relationships they have with perennial trees, olives, um, but also uh, the new possibilities with perennial grains. And I hear, Brona, that I might be out of time. So I'm just going to end with this last slide to show you that we're also building partnerships within people, with people here in the US. So this is a field trip I was on a couple weeks ago up to the Omaha or Omaha Reservation um, to build a language and culture revitalization project that values ethnobotanical knowledge. So thank you very much. Thank you, Aubrey, and thank you for needing, or well, apologies, sorry, for needing to kind of cut that a little short. There was so much in there. Uh, yeah, just what incredible work you all are up to. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are going to move into just the next pairing of speakers, which would be Daryl and Rodrigo. But I mean, that was uh, such an incredible amount of information. There was a lot in there. I invite you to just kind of take 10, 20, 30 seconds and just kind of let that settle because we can kind of let you know, information wash over us without really absorbing it. And so if you've got a pen or paper handy, or you just want to think to just like, yeah, what's sitting with you from those kind of presentations. And we'll just be 30 seconds and then we'll bring over to Daryl and then Rodrigo. All right, thank you for that. Thank you for the silence. And I hope that let some of that information absorb so that you're ready for our next round of speakers. Uh, Sarah, and we'll take Q&A, so don't worry if you have lots of questions, because I'm sure you do. Um, Sarah, will you take us into yeah. Daryl and Rodrigo here? Great, I thanks. will, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, there, as per usual, our conference takes on some really big topics and themes. And um, when we were doing preparation for this panel, uh, there were sort of two major things that emerged. And one was this first question that we asked Val and Aubrey about sort of like, how are you collaborating? And, and what does that mean in terms of this idea of um, land restoration and resilience? Um, but another theme that emerged in our conversations was really around uh, how we define resilience um, and then embody that, um, and particularly uh, facing the types of challenges that we are around climate change, um, we are entering a new era. Uh, things are fundamentally different. Um, we have been moving in that direction for a long time, but so much that has happened this year has really brought that into sharp focus. And so we thought that we would ask Daryl and Rodrigo to focus their conversations that way a little bit. So. What impact has the changing climate already had and how are you adapting to the new normal? And again, still they'll be thinking about these bigger ideas of um, uh, collaborative land restoration for resilience as they respond. So with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Rodrigo um, to talk to you a little bit more about his work and how it's answering that question. Hello again, I'm going to share the screen. All right, now assuming that you can see this Santa Lucia Preserve Grassland slide. Yep, and Rodrigo, just really quickly, can you hit the slideshow mode button? Oh. Yep. Get it. Thank you. Okay, so hello again to everybody. So this is a photo of the Santa Lucia Preserve. So I am the Storeship Director for Santa Lucia Preserve here in Carmel, California. 
like two hours south of San Francisco. And this place is, a, a, the, the Santa Lucia Conservancy, we are a land trust and we manage 18,000 acres of land. We own 10,000 of those, of those acres and we manage to ecological easements, the other 8,000. And so if, if you think about, let me just put my timer real quick. If, if you think about California grasslands, and, and that is a, a, a thing that has been discussed over the years that most people think that they're gone. Like the native grass, grass of California are completely gone and everything that we have are these invasive grasses. So this is an, an, an idea of how the grasslands in California used to look like a little, like some few perennial species of grasses and then a lot of wildflowers across the land. And most of these ecosystems were maintained by ecological uh, processes and human processes that I would like to think that we are part of nature. So I would include the human processes as ecological processes too. So a lot of Native American activities, burning the place, managing the land, a lot of uh, grazing through the, through, the, through the native ungulates. And all that changed with the European uh, arrival. I mean, they brought new species, both animal and, and vegetal and new ways to manage the land. So the, Santa, the land that the Santa Lucia preserve now endured two centuries of cattle ranching before it turned into, into a land trust. And two centuries of cattle ranching that was not precisely benefiting for the land, right? Like at, at when, when the land was purchased for, for further conservation, it was clearly overgrazed. Uh, the, the, the biodiversity of the place was going down. I mean, that was, that was one of the reasons why it got purchased to be preserve. So as a good conservation program, the first thing that happened was the cows got removed from the land. And as we have experienced in other places, when you have systems that depend on disturbance and you remove the disturbance from the land, you have a, a, a big recovery uh, period, but then the land needs that disturbance to keep itself healthy. So cows went away, Fire suppression is a thing. So there's no fire anymore on the lands. So the place are kind of like overgrown itself. And we turn from like open grasslands to having like shrub encroachment. And then in 2012, the, the conservancy just realized that the grasslands were like heavily oxidized, overgrown, the diversity was going down. Some of, some of, the, some of the key species that the conservancy was trying to, to protect were getting fewer and fewer, like California tiger salamander, grassland birds, even the vegetation was kind of like going down. So they decided to brought grazing back as a way to bring the disturbance back. Which this reminds us that when we deal with nature and we, when we deal with land management, pretty much we're dealing with change. And, and I feel like that brings this idea of resiliency, kind of like restoring the land and managing the land and caring for the land is bringing biodiversity back and it's increasing that resilience, right? Like that ability to endure changes. So cows were brought back and the objectives were pretty straightforward, kind of like reduce the, the, the thatch that was kind of like all the dead plant material on top of the grasses, improve the soil health, managing invasive species because we were getting kind of like these monocultures of invasives across the preserve manage shrub encroachment and reducing the fuel loads because now we're having fires in ways that fires were not happening in the past because we're just like collecting fuel year after year. And talking about change, the way we deal with what happens with every year is that we have a pretty big monitoring system. We have 27 exposures across the preserve where we measure the change. And beside this, we monitor wildlife species and weather patterns and all that. So in these exclosures, we pretty much like measure vegetation and how it changed in relation with grazing. So we can adapt our management pretty much like every year. We process all this data and I'm giving you kind of like the super slim version of it. Like if you have questions, just send me an email or something we can go through. Like it's hard to put all the results in one quick uh, presentation. So this is kind of like the difference that you can see like in the, in the non graze areas, you can see like heavy oxidized plants, like the diversity is going down in the grazing 
areas. There's way less old materials there. You can see another good photo of how, how things change. And our results overview is that the diversity increase when you care and you do the grazing in the right way. We're reducing the, the thatch, we're reducing the weeds, we're improving the ecological health and, and the aesthetics of the place. And when we're talking about how we adapt to the new normal, I, I, I was thinking kind of like how we adapt and I think everything comes to the people, right? It's kind of like, we are a really small staff and this year was just full of challenges. I mean, we have record highs as we had in 2019 and in 2018 and 2017. It was the driest, I mean, the hottest year on record as was the previous year and the year previous to that one. We have these intense fires, we had COVID and pretty much what the only, the biggest part that we kind of like our biggest strength was the people that we work with and kind of like how we built, how we built the resiliency within our team to go through these events. But like we're helping the land by doing all these restoration activities and all this good management. But at the same time, in order to keep that going, we need to bring that same care to our teammates. And I think like, I don't know if people here kind of like can relate to that, but I feel like this year has been putting so much pressure into our minds and how we feel about what we do. But I feel like the, the biggest, I feel like the resilience of our programs pretty much rely on the people. And that has been kind of like a pretty wild ride uh, to, to kind of like to take and, and, and to understand. And obviously with that, we're increasing our, our adaptability. We're acknowledging our limitations. We're increasing how flexible we can be. And obviously we have a grazing program within an institutional arrangement which brings so many other questions, right? I mean, this is not a ranch where if you have to work at 10 p.m. you just go, it's like, no, we need to have like uh, hourly paid employees so you cannot go overtime as you wish and, and you cannot work seven days a week. So all those things plus all the other constraints just put like so much pressure, but I think we have been navigating it in, in, a, in, a, in a very good way. And, and yeah, I think for us, the, the biggest thing and the strongest part was, was the staff and how, how to go through these, through these uh, issues and, and kind of like realizing that there's no, there's no new normal. I think it's more like a new reality of like changes and, and we're dealing with change and change now is, is, is just harder to predict. So we need to have more flexibility and, and, and resiliency. I think that's, that's all that I have now. Thanks, Rodrigo. That was wonderful. All right, uh, Daryl, I'm going to pass it to you again. Uh, to talk a little bit about your work and sort of this idea of um, how are you adapting to the new normal and thinking about resilience and particularly in uh, the relationships that we have with each other to make that happen. Well, thanks again, everybody. And uh, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about how we view resiliency and, and building the system at the Minokan farm and how we uh, attempt to educate and inform uh, the producers and the visits, uh, Burley County producers, uh, et cetera, that, that, that come to the farm. Again, uh, the farm uh, was the brainchild of our Soil Conservation District Board of Supervisors back in 2009. And essentially what it is, it's a, again, it's a conservation demonstration farm. And we use the soil health principles uh, to build resiliency and to regenerate soils. It's 150 acres. Uh, we have 10 fields, they're approximately tw uh, 12 acres apiece. And so we do different demonstrations and uh, we, we aren't an organic farm. 
per se, but we do limit the amount of chemicals we use. We do not use any insecticides, fungicides, or any commercial fertilizer on a field except one that is the control. But essentially what we do is, is we use the power of the soil health principles and the power of the soil and we work to regenerate uh, the soils. And so I'll run through quickly uh, the principles which were, uh, which were developed and, and, uh, and the thought process of what we go through. And you look at uh, what soil health is, and of course it's the continued capacity of the soil to function as a vital living ecosystem. We need to think of the soil as an, a living ecosystem. We know lots of the physical and chemical properties of soil, but we know very little about the biology, uh, the biological parts of, of the soil. And that's what we need to sustain plants, animals, and humans. So we look at armor at the soil and, and we compare, when you think of the microbes in the soil, uh, they need a home. And so the armor is there on the soil and it can be achieved by leaving the crop residue and growing plants. Uh, also green plants give us an inlet for carbon going into the soil. And I'll talk a little bit more about carbon and the carbon cycle. This particular photo that you see is actually a, a cover crop that we grazed on our ranch. And uh, you can see the residue and the armor and the soil protection that we have going on. And we're able to seed back into that. But again, first we have to minim, uh, armor the soil. We, we minimize soil disturbance. And this particularly applies to physical disturbance. Tillage, of course, is harmful. It removes pore spaces and, and slowly compresses the soil. And we use the example a lot of if you wanted to build a road, you'd till in order to and, and compact it. You wouldn't want because you'd be removing this pore spaces and compressing it. And so it restricts water infiltration and air movement, all right? And also you generally remove any soil armor and you release a burst of carbon dioxide that actually results in carbon loss, which is what we don't want. You know, obviously our current system is such that we're spending carbon. And so we wanna minimize soil disturbance. And so, of course, we're strictly no-till. We've managed to turn Burley County, which is approximately a million acres, uh, which about half of it is cropland and half of it is grasslands. We've, uh, we've managed to turn about 75 to 80% of it into no-till in Burley County. And so we're moving in the right directions. We need some plant diversity. Uh, this can be accomplished by growing all four crop types, right? And, and so in our current production model, we've simplified the landscape. That, that's something we all know. Uh, nature is not simplistic, obviously, right? And so when I talk about all four crop types, you have your warm and cool season broadleaves and your warm and cool season gra grasses. The most effective to have a rotation high in, hi in high carbon crops, such as wheat or corn and not low carbon crops like soybeans. Again, nothing against soybeans or any of that, but we need to have some diversity in the system if we're going to build soils and, and build resiliency. Uh, high carbon plants build soils, brings additional carbon into the soil profile and that turns into resiliency, right? So in, in our production model, we always suffer from too many twos we have, we're either too wet, we're too dry, we're too hot, we're too cold. Carbon and organic matter built into the system help equalize some of that. And so the amount and quality of carbon from crop residue contributes to the amount of soil carbon, which is our goal to increase. This particular photo is my two daughters, Audrey and Afton, and this is a nine way species cover crop mix again on our ranch the yellow flowers that you see blooming is actually African cabbage. And we grazed this cover crop. And, uh, and uh, so the cover crops are always a, a big part of what we do at the ranch. And, uh, 
again, it's about diversity. Uh, planting cover crops again needs to occur when we have a window. And so you hear some people say, well, they really don't fit into our system. You have to be creative and think out of the box sometimes in order to, to get these things done. Continually grow light living plants in the soil. This again relates back to cover crops. I think Rodrigo or someone, I, I believe it was Aubrey said this, our soils were built with perennials with a huge root mass. You've seen the photos, you've seen the pictures. Our production model is today is we farm with annuals with a much smaller root mass. A green plant continually growing is beneficial, beneficial because what? Nature is a constant feed process. We need to continually build soil aggregates. And of course, cover crops can fill in what otherwise would be a fallow period and continue bringing carbon into the soil, which is our goal. Finally, we need livestock integration. Animals, plants, and soils have worked together for since the beginning of time. We've simplified the landscape. We've taken the livestock off the land which is not a good thing. I believe Rodrigo showed the picture of, of, of when they took the, the livestock off the grasslands there, what can occur. We need the livestock back on the land. We can balance the carbon nitrogen ratio with livestock. Uh, we can manage our crop rotation residue for no-till seeding. And the livestock again, in our quest to put more carbon in, create the opportunity for more soil carbon. This is a picture at the Minokan farm of uh, the soil district. We own our own livestock at the Minokan farm and they're growing, uh, grazing a 13 way mix here, uh, cover crop mix. And uh, we now have some data on our gains and what we're doing uh, with the grazing of the cover crops. And uh, obviously with the, time limitations, uh, but know that uh, it's a good thing. Uh, in the plant economy, the currency is carbon, right? And it's the most important but overlooked aspect of plant nutrients. You look at carbon as money, but unfortunately today's production model misuses carbon. Factors affecting the balance between gains and losses of carbon. This again is from the Nature and Properties of Soils, the 14th edition, which is a Bible of knowledge on soil health. Excuse me. Oop. I gotta go back, sorry. Not sure how you, how you go back. Oh, okay. But you can see the list that factors promoting gains of what we do and what we need to do to promote carbon in our soil. And then of course you look at the losses that we have and you, it looks very much a lot like today's production model. The good news in all this is, is, is all these things are fixable and doable. And it's important to have a positive message. By using the soil health principles, we can build soils, we can build resiliency, we can uh, make things better within our systems and still be profitable. If your production model is putting more carbon in it than it's taking out, you are sustainable. If you are not, you're not going to be sustainable. And that's what it is plain and simple. This picture here is uh, some soil at the Minokan farm. Uh, Dr. Shiva today during her keynote, which again was an excellent presentation, made an analogy about the microbes in the soil and the microbes in our gut. And that is totally something uh, that, that, that is overlooked, but it needs to be addressed. There are trillions and trillions of microbes in this soil here that we see and which are related to our health of our people and uh, so you look at healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy people. Again, uh, thank you. Uh, these are a picture of my daughter. They're future regenerative agriculture experts. Uh, 
grazing experts. And uh, there is no era of agricultural greatness to which we must return. I believe the best of American agriculture and I, and I should say world agriculture is yet to come. And uh, it, 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 it really is. And I think, again, it's important to keep a positive message and uh, know that these things can be addressed and we can move in the right direction. A little self-education for you. And I know this is quick and I'm a little over time, uh, but uh, if you'd like to take a look at that, you're certainly welcome. So again, uh, appreciate it. Uh, the Minokinfarm.com and the Minokin Farm YouTube channel is definitely something uh, that we believe that you should take a look at. So thank you. Thanks, Darrell. Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, really wonderful to learn more about uh, the work that you're doing and how it relates to the questions that we're asking. Um, I think right now we're going to take maybe like three questions um, before we split you all into um, breakout rooms where you will be given the opportunity to meet some of your fellow uh, conference participants and have a conversation with all of the wisdom that is uh, on the call with us. Um, so there was a question earlier for Val that I'm gonna start with. Um, it says, in your projects, are there discussions about planting trees versus natural regeneration? Uh, yes, I tried to respond to it also in the chat box, but it's a good question. In many cases, the areas that we're looking to restore have been reduced. Uh, the species have been reduced to a size where the populations cannot naturally uh, regenerate. Um, and so that's a great question. Um, and so what we try to do is you can obviously restore an entire forest system. Instead, we work with uh, you know universities out of New Mexico, the Forest Service, Owen Bernie, uh, in Mora and looking at uh, these um, different agencies to help us best plan for how we, in, you know, plant our seedlings to make sure that we assure success. Um, but you can't plant the whole forest. So we're doing these smaller plots that will hopefully serve to restore, um, as, as Daryl talked about, the soils are very important. Um, and obviously, if you've got a high burn scar site um, and high intensity fires, um, you have to start with some uh, some thatch, some some kind of um, you know nursery nursery uh, for those seedlings to take hold and to obviously hold as much moisture as possible to assure success. So those are great questions. It's also what started us on replanting in the Pine Ridge area is there was a lot of, uh, there was a high fire there that took out almost all the ponderosa pine and the what was left in terms of the population would not allow for natural regeneration. And, and so that's a great, those are great questions. And so that's kind of the, uh, what we look at in terms of the scientific approach following research from the various universities who may or may not, you know, partner with us um, but certainly utilizing so the, the scientific method to determine the best trees and the number of trees uh, that need to be planted to restore those ecosystems. Thanks. Thanks, Val. Really appreciate that. Uh, we've got a question for Rodrigo. Um, are perennial native species returning under your grazing management? That's a very good question. So we, we have noticed an increase in perennials in the places where we are grazing. And you saw like all the, like the 27 exclosures and all the data that we collect. So we have a very hefty data set since the beginning of the grazing program in 2013, kind of like to trace how, how the landscape is changing and how the species have been moving in or moving out. So we noticed some patterns of perennial grasses increasing with the grazing and currently we we are working that data in a partnership with the USDA Agricultural Research Service in, in their North Dakota uh, research station so hopefully we'll get some peer review data about it but like 
if, if we just go by ex expert opinion and pure experience, we've been noticing an, a, a, an improvement on, on the conditions. But I would be cautious to be like, oh yeah, grazing just brought perennials back, right? It's kind of like, don't go there. So we, hopefully we'll get the, 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 the papers reviewed and all that soon. Thank you, Rodrigo. And um, uh, I'm going to ask one more question. This question is for Daryl. So Aubrey, I apologize that we're not going to ask you a question, um, but for the sake of time, and this person asked many questions. So Daryl, maybe you can pick one of them and give us a succinct answer. Um, so how long has the demonstration farm taken this holistic soil health approach? And how did you build the interest uh, and will within the district to take this approach? What advice do you have for others interested in seeing this model replicated in other places? Well, thanks for the question. And uh, so th the farm was started in 2009 and, and uh, the, the Burley County Soil District Board of Supervisors, which is far, uh, and our district conservationist at the time, Jay Fuhr, uh, it was their brainchild to start the Minokan farm. The holistic approach has been there from the beginning. And it was actually prior to 2009 where we were working with cover crops, seeing these systems, using multi-paddock adaptive grazing systems, no-till in those things. And of course, with that, we built the interest. It takes a team, right? And, and we put the, uh, our leader put together the team at the time and and it it didn't start out guns blazing that 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 isn't how it works but uh, I think if you look back in one of our first tours we probably had seven people there and and now we might get 307 so don't become discouraged but it takes a team it takes a uh a group of people heading in the same direction and we're very supportive of what we're doing. Your team doesn't have to consist of any, everybody around you as well. It, it can be, we have people that we consider part of the Minokan farm team that are 200 miles away, that are 2000 miles away, that are across the world. And, and, and so that's the approach that we take. Our boards, and of course there's con constant continual turnover, our board is constantly striving to get more interest built within the county. And sometimes they're even a bit disappointed because we seem to get more traction further away than we do in our own county. And, and so we've tried different things and different approaches to, to get that, that way. But the advice I give you, the big thing is, is of course, it's, it, it's about building a team, sticking with it, don't become discouraged and uh, uh, it, it will come together. And, and, you know, our philosophy at the Minokan farm, Jay Fear has told many people one field at a time. It, it, it seems like it can happen fast enough, but it's one field at a time. And, and so keep that in mind. Thank you, Daryl. Um... Thank you all for your answers. We have others in the chat box that we'll pass along to you. Um, so now is the part of our session where we will um, go into small breakout groups and I'm gonna pass it over to Brona to describe how we're gonna do that. Um, so, hi everybody. I think people are slowly beginning to filter back. Jen, if you are here, do you mind screen sharing the group map or Tyler maybe? Yep, certainly. Okay, I think we have most folks back. Welcome back. Thank you so much for sticking around and um, jumping in with uh, conversations with your fellow conference growers here. Um, this group map looks beautiful. We usually take a few minutes to read some of these and for the sake of time and giving our speakers a few minutes to respond to a final question and because you were able to see everybody's notes, um, I'm not going to do that this time, but here they are. And just to let you know, we are taking all of this, synthesizing it. We're going to be putting up some word clouds and some other 
type of making sense of all of these notes, um, both in the Crowd Compass and then on our website later. So just to let you know, um, this is not a exercise that then falls into a black hole. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to my co-facilitator, Brona, who is gonna take us into a final question for our speakers. Great, so hello everybody, welcome back. I hope they were worthwhile conversations and thank you for going with us in like some adjustments and changes as we've gone. We really did wanna give some good space to our panelists uh, as to for the final part of the session. Uh, and actually we've adjusted the question. Uh, we've pulled a question that uh, a participant asked that Jan William, I think. Uh, and so we, we uh, when we had a quick check in on this as you were guys were speaking about it, the panelists were really up for jumping into this question. So here we go. <clears throat> and so we can just, we didn't agree order here. So whoever feels like they wanna chip in and it'll be the kind of two minutes each. Uh, but the final conversation uh, that we'd love you to speak into, uh, how can we bring uh, our conversation and insights to people who are not part of our circle? How can we bring the regenerative approach across the fence? All right, Rodrigo, you look uh, like you're off your mute to me. So that feels like good enough reason. So why okay. don't we go Rodrigo, Aubrey, Daryl, Valerie, and two minutes each. Oh, yeah. Here we go. So I, I was saying that obviously I do not have an answer. I wish I can give you a solid and very profound answer for that question. I, I just have ideas. And I think like the first one is like, if it's across the fence, like you need to cross that fence in a educated way without being judgmental and kind of like walking, walking, walking those shoes, right? Like sometimes when you're bringing the regenerative approach to people, it's asking them to rethink or change their mind. And if something is being proven hard for humans is to change your minds. So don't expect that you will accomplish that over Thanksgiving dinner. That will be a very sad Thanksgiving dinner. Like don't push too hard. And I think it's like talk, talk and talk. One of my friends told me that in order to do this, we should become kind of like approachable examples. And I'm terrible at that sometimes. So so yeah, I, I think it's just like talk in a kind way, show the benefits, not being overly judgmental and yeah, just kind of like be engaged. Thanks, Rodrigo. I think what I have to say builds upon that. And like you, I would suggest that I don't have advice for other people so much as I can tell you the things I tell myself <laughs> um, in response to a question like this. And I often frame this question to myself as how can I build and sustain um, long-term uh, mutually beneficial and you know, in my case, perennial relationships. and. I often first just check my intention. Um, am I coming to that relationship building with a kind of mode of I need to correct someone else or am I coming with like a kind of ethos of myself as an ongoing learner myself? <laughs> um, am I, I can, in that case, as a learner, I can share my own learning experiences and, and talk about that versus uh, assuming that I'm the expert who needs to, to teach someone. And so, Positioning myself as a learner who's continuing to learn and will for the rest of my life has been helpful for me. Um, I also uh, often, instead of only uh, telling information um, or even sometimes telling stories, I often like to think about inviting people into experiences. So in our civic science work, we certainly share educational materials and we share stories, but 
first and foremost, we invite people to have firsthand experiences with these perennial plants themselves. And those are open-ended processes of discovery that are hands-on. And I think that's really important for how people learn. And then the last thing I just always tell myself is to uh, have courage <laughs> um, and, and stick with it in terms of these long-term relationships. So it means that I'm gonna have to give things up that I thought I knew and, and let go of things. And I'm gonna have to have courage, not in a kind of heroic individual sense, but in the kind of courage of encouragement um, sense and, and having heart um, and being there for myself and other people. So a little bit of my thoughts. My up next. On you go, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, well said, Aubrey. Uh, uh, pretty well spot on. But the, uh, you know, we talk about the Minokan farm and, and, and what we've done in, in our county and some of the things. And the basis is, is the soil health principles are universal. They work in all landscapes, all sizes across everywhere. Uh, they're universal and, and people need to understand that and people are starting to understand that more all the time. We have a, a growing urban conservation program here in Burley County with gardening and sus regenerative sustainable garden. And you can have an area two by two or you can have 20,000 acres. The principles are the same. It's all about the information and education the Minokan Farm, again, the Board of Supervisors and our leader, we had the vision. We have an open door policy. Leave the door open. If you want to walk through it, or if they want to walk through it, they'll walk through it. If they don't, they're not going to. But eventually, they may walk through it. We also think of the Minokan Farm as a safe place. We go there, we have discussions. Again, we host lots and lots of groups, have large workshops. I don't know how many people have been there the last two to three years, upwards of thousands, but it's a safe place. And we have these discussions that aren't always comfortable when we, when we, we are in a, a common group of say farmers and ranchers. And it's about collaboration. And, and, and so those things are all important, but uh, again, uh, Insights to people who are not part of our circle, I think, again, the, the open door policy, regenerative agriculture across the fence, you need a team and you need support. And, and your support may be 2000 miles away or it might be 20 feet, but you need support. We're not always kind in agriculture. You know, we joke a lot in Burley County about staying out of the coffee shops and the bars, right? Because farmers and ranchers are kind of sometimes our own worst enemies. What isn't traditional, people don't like, right? And some of the things that make us great in agriculture with our tradition and some of the things we do are also our downside. So we need to, to keep that in, in mind, but uh, I guess that's how I would, would answer that question, so. Thanks, Daryl. And Valerie, your final speaker. Hi, thank you so much beautiful responses from these uh, panel members that I'm just so honored to be included with. Um, and I know that, uh, that you know, that this has been mentioned um, previously. I, th I loved Aubrey's response as well. Um, but what we try to do is connect the community members, particularly youth, um, and reach out. For instance, we work with the Santa Fe Indian School um, and we have a, a deep um, commitment to working within um, educational institutions. Uh, for instance, partnering with the National Indian Youth Leadership Project, partnering with the Santa Fe Indian School, um, with uh, you know, other groups that work within those communities or tangentially um, and what I feel is important is, is our youth are, are the ambassadors. 
up tomorrow. Um, and just like Daryl's great slide with his daughters, the next generation, I think what we you know, should recognize is that they help to spread this information to community members at large to engage the, those community members in a process they might not otherwise. Uh, for instance, with Quivera, we're having, you know, ranchers and farmers who normally don't participate in these kinds of things. Um, we're going to be able to reach out to them and provide some workshops. So um, definitely working with youth and, and focusing on the education and supporting um, on the ground projects from leaders within those communities, I think is a great way to, to start. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. That brings us to the end of our panel. I know Sarah's got some final bits and pieces to say. Uh, certainly from my perspective, it's been an absolute honor to uh, be working with you on this panel. That was an incredible, uh, a lot of insight and experience and wisdom coming through there. And I'm sure that our participants loved it too. So thank